Hi, I'm Tammy Potter, and welcome to the Pregnancy Process Podcast, a show designed to help you navigate the hugely transformative journey to motherhood, where you'll hear the unique experience of experts in this area and the incredible stories of women sharing their conception, pregnancy, and postnatal journeys so that you can have a healthier, more informed pregnancy. In today's episode, I talk to clinical naturopath and nutritionist, Rebecca Warren. Rebecca is an experienced clinical naturopath and nutritionist, lecturer of nutritional medicine and naturopathy, and is currently finishing her PhD after having undertaken extensive postgraduate study in public health, dietary behavioral change, and functional medicine. You may even recognize Rebecca as the Sunday Telegraph's Body and Soul magazine naturopathic expert. Rebecca works with women and their partners right through from preconception and preparing the body to have the most healthy pregnancy and baby possible. She continues this care throughout pregnancy and into the postpartum period using a combination of nutrition, herbal medicine and lifestyle recommendations. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about why there is more to the story when it comes to C-section deliveries and how they don't just end with a full stop after the surgery. We'll talk gut microbiome and how women can best support themselves and their babies to have the best start to life and recovering post-birth. Rebecca, thank you so much for your time today. It is so fantastic to have you here with us. No, thanks for having me. I'm really looking forward to diving into this conversation. It's something that I'm really passionate and excited about. So I think when it comes to all things motherhood, I know I've said this before and I will say it again, but I firmly, firmly believe that all women have a story when it comes to motherhood. And this is irrespective of whether they have children or not, because I just don't think that any woman can move through this time of their lives without some type of personal journey. And if it's okay with you, I think the best place to start is with your own journey to motherhood and talk a little bit about how this has influenced your work. Yeah. So look, for me, being a mother was always something that I wanted. I knew, I think from a very young age that I always wanted to be a mum. So when it came time for my husband and I to talk about having a family, it was a really, really conscious choice for us. And I guess all the work that I had done from a naturopathic standpoint you know, knowing all the things that I know about preconception health and the importance of preconception, it just felt to me that I really had to take it seriously, you know, take conception and pregnancy really seriously because I had wanted to be a mum for such a long period of time and growing a baby is a pretty nutrient expensive process like it's a big deal to grow a little human (laughs) so I really wanted to make sure that I was even healthier going into that preconception period and I also wanted to be really well during my pregnancy because I have had and have a lot of balls in the air and I really didn't want to be someone that was struggling for nine months I wanted to be feeling really vital and really well So thankfully, you know, everything went really beautifully. We conceived really quite quickly and my pregnancy was pretty good. It was pretty textbook. I mean, I did all of the things during my pregnancy. I, you know, saw an osteo, I had acupuncture, I was taking my supplements, I saw a PT twice a week, I saw a psychologist in terms of just prepping for where things were going to be going in terms of this new chapter. And it was great. Like everything during my pregnancy felt really good. And then, you know, you start to get closer and closer to labor and I hit sort of 35, 36 weeks and everyone sort of started saying to me, oh, you might go early. I think 
to go early. But my husband and I had a bit of a running joke because he's always late and I'm always early. So we were sort of having this running joke about whose personality the baby was going to take on, whether they were going to be early and on time like me or late like their dad. And as it turned out, my little girl, our little girl, ended up being born at 42 plus two. But what had happened was I was actually in pre-labor for two weeks. So I was getting pretty intense pre-labor pains or signs of labor for that period of time and then when labor finally kicked off yeah it was pretty it was pretty full on but it was also taking a really long time so I had lost my mucus plug at three o'clock on the Monday morning and was basically laboring at home had fantastic midwife who still to this day i I credit my little girl being here because of her, but basically I was at home laboring and I couldn't actually keep anything down. I couldn't stomach anything because I was just vomiting if I ate anything. So got through the day and whatnot. And then we got to probably about nine or 10 o'clock at night. And my husband said, no, I'm taking you in to the hospital just to at least get some fluids because you know at this point I was still quite optimistic that I was going to have a vaginal birth and I wanted our baby to come when she was ready to come so we went in and had some monitoring and and she was all fine still her, everything was great but I had the bag of fluids and then I had a long hot shower because it was the, the hot water was the thing that really helped me manage my pain and I got out of the shower and they put the, the monitor back on my tummy to monitor the baby and our daughter's heart rate started doing some really funny things. So they kept me attached to the monitor and they said, look, why don't we try and move this along? So they broke my waters and again, still another couple of hours, nothing had happened. The labor had basically stopped at that point. So they started talking about cesarean and still at this point, I was like, no, 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 no. When I'm not interested in a cesarean, I'm good to go. I want to let my body do what it needs to do to have this baby. And so my obstetrician was fantastic. He was like, yeah, okay, no, no problems. We can wait a little bit longer. And I think it was about sort of two o'clock, then the Tuesday morning, so it's almost 24 hours at this point, we were having a bit of a sleep because everything had basically stopped. And then the alarm went off on the monitor and the, the monitor had been doing really funny things all the way throughout the period that I was on it. But something in my intuition made me turn around and have a look at it. And I just noticed that our baby's heart rate was down at 30 so I woke my husband up. I said, you need to go and get Joe." And she was already coming back into the room at this point. And they checked on the, the report and she'd had what's called a massive deceleration. So her heart rate went up to 250 and then absolutely crashed. So at this point, then the obstetrician was like, we really need to get this baby out. And I'm saying to my husband, I don't want to have a cesarean. I really don't want to have a cesarean. And then I looked to Joe, who was our midwife, and I'm still getting quite teary thinking about it now, but she said to me, no, we have to get this baby out now. Um, so it was in that moment that I really had to make a decision and go, okay, let's, let's go, let's get this baby out. And it was this huge moment of just surrender because I guess with all my naturopathic knowledge and with all the things that I understand about cesareans and the impact that they can have on a baby's health long term I really wanted to avoid that but in that moment all I was interested in was getting my baby out safely which still to this day is the best decision that I made but it was so important for me to have someone in the room that I really trusted to not feel like I was just getting pushed down the cesarean route so within 15 minutes from us making that call of yeah let's have a cesarean Penelope was out she was in my arms and she was actually quite sick she had gone into a huge amount of distress she had done a huge poo inside of me she had to have 
sort of 25 mils of meconium suctioned from her lungs. She was on antibiotics within the first couple of hours of life. She was in the um, special care for, I think it was four days. So, you know, all the things that I thought I was going to have around birth were quite different to what I ended up having. I still was okay with it because I had done all the prep work to begin with around look, if I end up with a cesarean, I wanted to know that I had done absolutely everything possible to ensure that I could have a natural birth, but it just didn't work out like that for us. So it really hit home for me when the surgeon was stitching me up. He's I'm blubbering to him saying, my God, thank you so much for getting her out safely. And he just said, no, thank you for taking my advice because if we'd waited another 30 minutes, he said, you probably wouldn't have had a baby. So that for me was just, I don't know if validation is the right word, but it was such an important lesson to sometimes be able to just recognize that sometimes things just don't go to plan. And sometimes you do just have to step back and completely surrender and go, well, let's just do what we need to do. And, you know, thankfully, my husband and I had also really talked about it. So we had some sort of contingencies in our birth plan about, you know, what would happen if we had a cesarean. So he knew exactly where he needed to be. He knew that he was not to leave that baby's side. He knew skin to skin. He knew all of those things that needed to happen. But on reflection, it was a really sort of interesting and powerful thing to have to go through because when I thought about what my journey was going to be like, I always had sort of imagined myself having a vaginal birth and then I ended up with a cesarean. And like I said, knowing all the things that I know about the impact that cesarean's birth have on a baby's microbiome and the impact that that then has on their overall health and well-being, it's just really spurred me even further to support women who go through cesareans, but to also educate them about what this means for their baby moving forward. So long-winded story about our our birth and how we got there. That's such an amazing story. Thank you so much for sharing that. And there's, I've taken so many notes and there's so (laughs) many places that I would really want to go with this, but I also really want to talk about C-sections and gut microbiome. So can we talk a little bit to gut microbiome now and why this is such an important area? when it comes to pregnancy and postpartum and then maybe get into, well, not maybe, but then let's get into specifics around C-section babies and why it's so important. Yeah, absolutely. So as a naturopath, I specialize in gut health. So the microbiome and I go way back. I'm really interested in the microbiome and the role that it plays in our overall health and well-being. And I guess to answer your question, there's a couple of different aspects that we need to have a look at because the gut plays a role in so many different aspects of the body. You know, we have these things in the body called axes. And I like to describe an axis as a, a multi-arm seesaw that is always moving. It's it's very dynamic. It's assessing the situation. Then it's always sort of changing to try and recalibrate and rebalance to ensure that you know, everything is working as it should in our body. So when it comes to the gut, we've got the gut brain axis, we've got the gut hormone axis, we've got, you know, the gut thyroid axis. There are so many different areas that the gut specifically affects within the body. And if we think about it from a very basic, basic level, if your gut is not working well, you're not going to be absorbing nutrients and you're not going to be eliminating toxins properly. So if those two things aren't working, then there's no way the rest of your body can work very well. But the gut is also really important when it comes to managing inflammation and inflammation and keeping inflammation at bay is probably one of the biggest aspects that we need to have a look at for optimizing overall health and well-being. And in terms of pregnancy and in terms of preconception, there's a bit of debate in the literature at the moment as to how a baby's microbiome is 
um, colonized because we used to think that bugs only got into a baby's microbiome once they came out into the world. Um, but that's actually been pretty hotly contested at the moment. And we know that the balance of bacteria within the mother's microbiome drastically impact what's going on with the baby's microbiome, whether they are born via cesarean or vaginally. So there's a very, in my mind, important part in making sure that a mother's microbiome or a potential mother's microbiome is settled and sorted before she even thinks about having a baby because there are a number of things that will influence the microbiome when you become pregnant. I'm sure I don't have to talk about constipation issues or reflux or those sorts of things that are very typical issues that will affect a woman's digestive system when she is pregnant. So ensuring that we get the microbiome balanced before we put that additional stress and pregnancy is an additional stress on the body making sure that we have that balance there is I think really quite crucial to begin with but the other really important thing that we need to be mindful of with the microbiome is it has a significant role to play in helping to regulate immune function so there again there are lots of things that will influence the immune function of a woman during her pregnancy, but also the baby's immune function as well. So just getting that balance right, I think is really important. Mm, absolutely. In the creation of the pregnancy process program, I did a lot of research as well around, obviously not as much as you, but I did a lot of research around gut microbiome and how it affects pregnancy and what you're saying about how they're seeing changes in, in the research to how a baby's gut microbiome is formed during pregnancy. So I absolutely, like it's an area that fascinates me as well. So what can mothers do in preconception and pregnancy stage to help boost their gut microbiome? And I mean, we know that there's prebiotics, probiotics, all that type of thing. And also something that I'd really like to know about that you mentioned is I get so many pregnant women talk to me about their constipation and their reflux. And so I feel like this question's got two tiers, like what can you do to help boost it during pregnancy? What can you help to cultivate a really healthy gut microbiome pre-pregnancy? And then we'll talk about the bit of the postnatal. Yeah, 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 for sure. So I think the first thing is for women to get really comfortable about discussing their poos and understanding what their poos are like, because that is sort of one of the biggest report cards that tells us about the state of the microbiome. So I generally talk about bowel movements in what I call the four Fs. So I want to understand someone's frequency and how often they're going. And that should be at least once per day. Okay. The second aspect that we want to have a look at is the form of someone's poo and that poo should really be coming out in a relatively long sausage. It could come in pieces, but we generally want it coming out and holding its shape and its form. The third thing is looking around what it feels like when you do a poo. So it should be relatively easy to pass. There shouldn't be any straining or any urgency where you like got to run to the bathroom. It should just be pretty easy to pass and you should feel quite empty and relieved after you go. And then the final thing to look at is any further inclusions that you might be seeing. So are you seeing undigested food? Are you seeing blood? Are you seeing mucus? Is your poo sticky? Is it leaving marks on the toilet bowl? Is Has it got a really bad odor to it? So all of those things are really important to be looking at in that preconception sort of phase, because if you're outside of those aspects, then that could be giving us clues as to something not being quite right. So normally with my patients, we have a very big discussion about poo. And I guess I can sort of use my clinical expertise to figure out, okay, what actually is going on here? 
But there are also some functional pathology tests that we look at doing in our clinic that basically get people to scoop up their poo, put it in a container, send it off to the lab, and then we get a very comprehensive report back of all the different types of bugs and chemicals that are found within your gut. So that is something that I use a lot of the time uh, for women in preconception, especially if there is a history excuse me, a history of autoimmune diseases, allergies, eczema, type 1 diabetes, celiac disease, metabolic issues, any of those sorts of things that we know are linked with microbial imbalances and are linked with cesarean deliveries, we will absolutely look at at doing some testing around that. Mm. Amazing. Do you know what? This is totally beside the point. But when you're talking about discussing poo with your like (laughs) preconception and kind of conception (laughs) patients, in my head, I was like, well, that's just getting them ready to have toddlers then when like there's there's so many discussions about poo and like all kinds. Absolutely. And also as a mother, looking at your baby's poo, like I was an absolute Hawkeye over Penelope's poo. And again, like I think sometimes, you know, working in health, you just can sometimes know too much. But I was very, very conscious of what was going on with her gut and her poos, being a cesarean born baby, then also having antibiotics for the first 36 hours of her life, knowing that there's a family history of asthma, eczema, you know, hay fever, it's all, and that's just on my side, like, you know, so there's quite strong allergic family history. So I just was like watching her poos like an absolute hawk. So you got to get, if you, if you're thinking about having a baby, if you're not already really comfortable looking and talking and assessing poos, you're just going to have to be, you just, if you've got a phobia or a fear around that, I always tell my mums, you just got to get over it. It's something that gives us so much really important information. So yeah, that's, Mm. that's the gold for me. That's so interesting, isn't it? So let's talk pregnancy, you know, because definitely constipation, reflux, all that type of thing is so common during pregnancy. Mm. And I know that that would be affecting gut microbiome. Can we talk about how pregnancy does affect the gut microbiome and some things that we can do to maybe help that? Yeah, sure. So there's two parts to that answer, I think, because there is also a lot of hormones that are flying around during pregnancy as well. So the hormones can directly affect what's going on with the gut, but then the gut can also then feed back as well. So one of the biggest things that we see with constipation is that's normally a a hormone related thing in, in response to progesterone. But there are also lots of things that we could be doing from a diet and lifestyle standpoint. And contrary to what a lot of women think or come in and say, it's not always about just increasing your fiber levels. That can sometimes be part of it, ensuring that you get enough fiber, especially if throughout your pregnancy, you're a bit nauseous and you're not feeling like eating. So therefore the volume of food that you're consuming is less, which means you're not filling your bowel and you're not emptying properly. So there's a number of other elements to also be thinking about, but some really simple things that I like to encourage women to do if there is constipation, kiwi fruit, two kiwi fruit a day. That's one of the best things that you can do to get your bowels moving. So also really helpful as well to get things sort of moving. Another nice gentle one that I like to encourage women to do is using things like flax seeds and chia seeds, but making them into essentially like a chia pudding. So whether you soak those in some yogurt or some milk or milk alternatives, that will activate a lot of their slippery substances, which actually then helps to hydrate the bowel. And then that can help alleviate constipation as well. Just speaking of hydration, looking at water intake as well is something that is the first thing that we need to have a look at in terms of constipation. Because again, if you're not feeling very well or if you're busy and you're just forgetting, maybe this is your second pregnancy and you're running around after a toddler um, and you just don't have time to drink, 
ensuring that you're adequately hydrated is really important for overall bowel health. But I think the other aspect that we also need to possibly have a look at is supplementation because the load that pregnancy can have on someone's body, sometimes we just need a little bit of extra support. So look, supplements should only be taken, in my opinion, under the advice of someone who knows what they're doing because you can cause a lot of unfavorable outcomes if you take them at the wrong dose or the wrong form. So you really need to know what you're doing with supplements. And a lot of people say, oh, it's just a probiotic. But, you know, probiotics are really quite amazing. They are very strain specific. They have very specific outcomes and actions when you take them. So if you take the wrong type of probiotic for the wrong condition or the right condition, you're going to alter the outcome that you're getting. So I do often prescribe probiotics to my pregnant women. But again, the strain that I'm prescribing is going to be different based on whether They've got gut issues, whether they're low risk, whether they need anti-inflammatory support, whether they need some mental health support, because we've got probiotics that also support mental health. So there's a number of different things that we need to be thinking about and considering before we do prescribe. And that goes with nutrients as well. You know, I know a lot of women will take a, a pregnancy multivitamin or something, but it's also ensuring that they're metabolizing and absorbing those nutrients that they need. And unfortunately, a lot of the off the shelf multivitamins targeted at pregnant women also have forms of minerals in them, particularly iron that is constipating. So that is also something to think about as well. Mm. I love that individualized approach. I mean, I think everything to do with pregnancy, I mean, health in general is pretty individualized. And I feel like the way that we are approaching health is starting to move more in that individualized kind of direction, which is fantastic. So I really like that individualized approach. And I think there's some really great tips for pregnancy in there. Now let's talk C-section because we've covered preconception, we've covered pregnancy. Let's really dive into microbiome, C-section, all that type of thing. So we talk what C-section delivery can do to the baby's microbiome and how we can help that yeah I think the first thing that we just need to sort of maybe touch on is that c-sections are not bad and I I know that sometimes they get a bit of a bad rap especially when we're talking about the microbiome because they do they do impact the microbiome that's unquestionable they have a significant impact on a baby's developing microbiome but The key thing we have to think about when it comes to birth is we want a healthy baby and a healthy, safe mother at the end of it. That's the key thing that we want to have a look at. So, look, I also understand that it can be confronting for people to hear these things as well, especially if you've been through a cesarean and and didn't really know any of these sorts of things and then all of a sudden you're hearing these things. This is not about imparting guilt or shame or blame or any of those sorts of things. There are a whole host of things that we can do to support babies that are born by a cesarean. But as you said and as I alluded to, having a C-section does influence the microbiome of the baby. So typically when a baby is born vaginally, their gut microbiome will be colonized with bacteria from the mother's vagina. There is also some evidence that it can also be colonized by some bacteria that are in the mother's gut, so the the mother's colon. But babies that are born via cesarean are more likely to have their microbiomes colonized by the bacteria that are actually on the mother's skin or that are available in the hospital at the time. So the types of bacteria and how they interact, particularly when we're looking at immune function, can be different. 
So what we see is babies that are born via cesarean are more likely to have an increased risk of things like asthma, allergies, hay fever, celiac disease, inflammatory bowel disease, type 1 diabetes. There was a meta-analysis that I was reading a couple of weeks ago that looked at associations with the autism spectrum disorders, looking at ADHD. So there are a number of things that will increase risk, but we also have to remember that it's not a causation aspect. It's just something that we have started to notice some links and some trends with. So there's definitely differences in those babies that are born via cesarean compared to those that are born vaginally. Mm, and absolutely. Just to recap on what you were saying before, in no way is this a conversation against C-section no. delivery. No. They're a huge leap forward for the safety of the mum, for the safety of the baby. This is more about this is more about knowledge and understanding yeah, how absolutely. you can better support your own health and well-being, your baby's health and well-being if they've been birthed via cesarean section. Absolutely. Um, and that understanding that a, yeah. a C-section can increase a baby's chance of developing allergies and may alter their immune system later in life. Yeah. So what can you do in the early stages of a, a post-birth to help with these things? Yeah, so there are a few different things to be thinking about. The first thing that is, excuse me, showing in the research to be the most protective and helping to have the microbiome of cesarean babies bounce back is breastfeeding. So that can sometimes be a bit of a catch-22 because when you give birth via cesarean, your body hasn't gone through the normal physiological processes that has your brain recognised the fact that there's no longer a baby inside. So it can take a little while for breastfeeding to sometimes kick off in women who have gone through a cesarean. That was something that I've was actually very lucky. We didn't, we had beautiful breastfeeding sort of journey. And there are actually a couple of breastfeeding courses that you can look at doing. Um, the one that I am a really strong advocate of, I'm not affiliated with them in any way, but is um, looking at the Thompson method. So Dr. Robin Thompson, she did her PhD around breastfeeding and correct attachment and all of those sorts of things. And I've been following her work for a little while and as a mother and as a researcher, I think she's fantastic. So if anyone is concerned about breastfeeding or really interested in breastfeeding, I really recommend go and check out some of her stuff because it is one of the biggest things that you can do to support the microbiome of cesarean babies in those first sort of, they, they recommend six months, the research recommends six months, but the longer you can breastfeed, the better. The second thing to think about is something called vaginal seeding. So this is a, a bit of a novel therapeutic tool that is really just started to take traction in the last, I would say probably five to 10 years. The, the literature and the medical fraternity, I think, seem to be split on it because there are no long-term studies that have been done. But there are some, I guess, groundbreaking studies that or pilot studies that have been done that have showed that babies who are exposed to the vaginal fluids of mothers, so sorry, cesarean babies that are um, exposed to the vaginal fluids of mothers actually have restoration of their microbiome. So there is protocols and things like that that have been published, but basically what is involved with vaginal seeding is a piece of sterile gauze is inserted into the woman's vagina. So it soaks up the bacteria in the vaginal fluids. And then immediately once the baby is born, they're swabbed over their mouth, nose, eyelids. I think that's all. And just or just basically over their body, they're swabbed with these bacteria. And yeah, so the, the preliminary research is promising around that. It was something that we had spoken about to our obstetrician and he was totally fine doing it. But unfortunately, because Penelope was so sick, when she came out, we there was just no time to do it. Like she was 
having oxygen and a whole host of other things. But if you do have the luxury of that, like if you have a planned cesarean or if you're having a cesarean that's not an emergency, that's definitely something to have a chat to your care team about. Skin to skin contact in terms of microbiome restoration that is also something that's really important. And that was something I had researched pretty heavily going into things. So as soon as I got Penelope in my arms, she was just on me, like constantly for as long as I think we're in hospital for five days. And I, I don't think she was off me the whole time because I was, I was really keen to get all of my bugs into her because I just figured, and there's no literature to really back this up, but I wanted her to be exposed to my bugs rather than the bugs of the hospital. So she was on me. So that's sort of what we can do in those first sort of hours, days. And then we start to look at probiotics. So again, there are specific probiotics for infants and babies that we would look at. And I often encourage mothers to just mix those up in a little bit of breast milk and to use a syringe or a dropper and just get that into into bub. But I guess the thing with the microbiome is that it is constantly changing and adapting and developing. So there is some evidence that the microbiome will keep changing up until seven years, the first seven years before it then starts to take on a more sort of adult profile where it's not as malleable. So again, you know, for babies that are born by a cesarean, mums and dads have got sort of seven years or so that they can continue to work on their child's gut health and to get that as strong as possible. So one of the other aspects that I was really passionate about also from a gut perspective for Penelope was looking at baby lead weaning when we introduced solids. So I I waited for six months before I introduced solids for her. I wanted to make sure that she was really ready. And then also to we brought in some fermented foods pretty early on when she was able to stomach those because it's different sort of taste profiles and things. But I also wanted her to really connect with food and to be listening to her digestive system and for me to be able to assess what was going on with her digestive system as opposed to, I don't want to say force feeding because that's not the right term, but I, I wanted her to experience what her gut was doing um, when she was eating food. And then the other thing that I've been really pro about is getting her in the dirt. (laughs) We try and get outside most days. We have a dog. Like I have let him be around her from the second that she was at home. We have family members that have dogs. I let them lick her. She cuddles them. Like I want her to be exposed to as many different microbes as she can be because also too we know that things like the hygiene hypothesis when everything has been sanitized within an inch of its life like that also significantly increases the risk of asthma and allergies and food intolerances and all of those bits and pieces so for me it's also about ensuring that we live you know a clean healthy life but not a sterile life and I let her explore and do all the things that kids do, but I probably let her go a little bit more because I'm trying to strengthen that microbiome. Mm. I certainly remember when I was a little kid, we were like eating mud and like, yeah. <laughs> we, were, we were in the mud. I've got pictures of me where we <laughs> like eating sand, you know, there was, no, there was no question of any of that type yeah. of thing. And we certainly didn't live in sterile environments back then. I don't even think there was like hand sanitizer yeah. back then and I guess this, there, but way back then <laughs> yeah but I guess this is the thing in a post-covid world right is there's sanitizer on every corner of every building in everything that you go into and I think sometimes we just have to use our common sense as mothers and go well do we really need to sanitize or can we just clean can we just wipe because you do want 
what I want. I want Penelope exposed to some of those bugs because I want her immune system to be knowing what it needs to do, not just sort of hanging out in the background with its feet up, just not really doing much. So the constant exposure to those little bugs over time is absolutely crucial for optimizing immune function. Now, you mentioned something before about getting her to listen to her digestive system. Mm. I was like, what, what does that mean? <laughs> like, so when you say that, like, you know, how, how old is Penelope now? Penelope is 13 months now. So how do you get a 13-month-old to listen to their digestive system? That certainly piqued my interest. Yeah. I want her to know when she's full. I want her to know what makes her feel good, what she wants to have more of, what she likes the taste of, what she likes the texture of, what she enjoys eating. I think so often we think as parents that we know what's best for our child, which to a degree I kind of understand and can sympathise with, I guess. But we also have to remember that our children are their own little individuals they're their own little person and it's our job I believe as a parent to acknowledge and listen and interpret what they're trying to tell us instead of us just putting our views and our experiences onto them so whenever I provide her lunch I always provide her with some options and I just watch. I see what she does. I see what she goes for. And I also see what she leaves. And I just sort of, I guess, be curious about that. Mm, I like that. That's great. Now, I know that was a little bit off topic there. (laughs) Um, Sorry. (laughs) Now, I think when it comes to C-section, and I'm sure a lot of women think once you have a c-section that's all there is to it but you've just said there's definitely more to the story let's talk a little bit about why it doesn't just end with a full stop after the surgery yeah and I think there's probably two elements to that right there's what goes on with the mother and there's what goes on with the baby So we have to remember that caesareans, whilst they're very common surgeries, they're still major surgeries. And you would be able to sort of talk to this probably better than what I would in terms of all the different muscles and things like that that are cut through. But like it's major surgery. Seven layers. There's seven layers that they need to go through. And it's that common but not normal saying that pops up again. And I'll try not to go off on a tangent here, but (laughs) honestly, when it comes to C-section surgery, if you were going into major shoulder surgery or hip surgery, you would have prehab before, specific prehab and things that you would need to do to prepare yourself for that surgery. And then you would have things to do after and you'd be visiting the physio and there'd be specific exercises that you need to do. And there would be protocols around it. They don't have that for C-section. It's like, don't lift your baby, don't drive your car and off you go. Yes. And they've just had major abdominal surgery. But yes. you know, that I think that might be a topic for an, another time. <laughs> yeah. Look, I I couldn't agree more. And I think this is probably part of it, right? It's not just you got your baby and we forget everything else. And this is why I really encourage women, regardless of whether they're having a cesarean or a vaginal birth, you got to do the work throughout your preconception and your pregnancy period. Because if you have a cesarean, you want to put yourself in the best possible position to be able to bounce back from that really well. But I guess once you've had that surgery, there is a hell of a lot of healing that needs to happen after that. And not only has your body gone to the brink of getting very close to death in terms of pain thresholds, but you've also just used a hell of a lot of nutrients, a hell of a lot of energy. And if you haven't been mindful of where your nutrient levels have been, you come out of pregnancy in a depleted state. 
And if you've had a cesarean, you don't have much in the tank for repair and recovery. So it's one of the things that I always say to any of the women that I'm working with in that last consultation before they go off to have their babies is if you have a cesarean, you have to email me straight away because there are a whole lot of nutrients and a whole lot of additional support that we need to give you to ensure that you can heal in the best possible way, limiting scar tissue as much as possible but also to ensure that we can look at limiting the amount of pain relief that you need because post-Caesar is pretty full on. Like I was actually not prepared for the amount of pain that I was in post-Caesarian. I remember trying to get up out of bed one of the nights that I, I think it was like the first or the second night that we had arrived home and I could not sit up. And I remember holding on to the top of the bed head and like cringing to just try and sit up. And in the end, I had to wake my husband up to help me because I had always been someone who was very fit, very healthy, very able. So for me to be, without sounding dramatic, incapacitated like that, not being able to even sit up in bed, like that was a real shock for me. So I think ensuring that you have those nutrients available or you have a a trusted person that can help prescribe those things for you is actually really, really important. Hmm. So are there any, I know that I'm trying to simplify something that is actually very complex, Mm -hmm. but are there any kind of nutritional components that you can share with us that women can use to help their healing journey? But before we go down that path, I just need to say, how wild is it that the pain of childbirth oh my is God. as close to death as you can possibly get that pain threshold? That is yeah. just wild. I know. And I was actually mentioning this to my husband the other night and I was like, isn't it amazing that women get so close to death to bring in new life? And I just, I'd never really thought about it like that before. And I was like, that is such an amazing concept by mother nature. Like it just, it does, it blows my mind. Like so many things about the human body and nature just completely blow my mind. But particularly that one, I just think is amazing. That's yeah, um, wild. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but to answer your question around nutrient support, there are a couple that I'm very happy to talk about. The first one is collagen mm-hmm. uh, and using collagen protein powders. So the evidence around collagen is actually really quite substantial and quite good in terms of how it can support connective tissue. So I took collagen throughout my pregnancy. I took it in larger doses uh, in my postpartum period because I knew my body was requiring a lot of additional support to heal up all those layers that had been cut through. Um, The second thing that I always look at optimizing for women postpartum with cesareans is vitamin C. The vitamin C is a very underrated nutrient in my opinion. It does so many different things to support overall health and well-being, but it works together with zinc to help with collagen um, formation. So if we're increasing the amount of collagen that we're taking and then we've got um, vitamin C and zinc, that also helps to prevent keloid scarring. So a keloid scar is basically where the connective tissue comes together and it sort of bulges a little bit. It doesn't heal flat. Um, and this can often be one of the things that a lot of women experience with their scar and why their scar can be so sore for such a long period of time as well. So looking at your zinc and vitamin C status, I think is really important. Amazing. Now I'd like to speak a little bit about your current research because your current research is, I know it's more focused towards cancer patients and their carers Mm -hmm. and the carer's health, 
However, I do feel like some of the findings that I know that you're researching at the moment can also be applied to mothers. And from what I can see, mums do potentially fall into two kind of categories or two camps. And those who really do focus on their health and well-being, knowing that their entire family's health and well-being is almost reliant on their health and well-being. And those women, those mothers that kind of lose sight of their own health and well-being, caring for their family. So can we talk a little bit about your current research and how it may apply to mothers? Yeah. That's yeah, possible. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So yes, like you said, the area of my research is looking at how being a cancer caregiver influences dietary behaviours in the carer. So basically when you're looking after someone, what happens to the person that is providing care. So my research is looking specifically at, as you said, cancer caregivers, but this is a really novel space. Like for me, I started this whole PhD in research thing because I noticed some trends in my clinic when it came to cancer caregivers. Um, But when I actually went to the literature and I started looking through the data, there was actually nothing that was done on cancer caregivers and dietary behaviours. And for me, that kind of blew my mind a little bit because I'm like, well, here we have this system that is set up where if you get cancer, you are relying on a family member to get well and to look after you through that process. But if that person then loses sight or track of what they're actually eating, then nutrition just affects so many other aspects of someone's health, including cancer risk. So it just, it didn't quite make sense to me, especially when I started sort of looking at things from a public health perspective. But interestingly, because there was no research done on cancer caregivers, some of the research that I looked at to help inform my research was looking at parent caregivers and it was of sort of children with special needs or high needs but I think the really interesting thing here is when we look at something called self-efficacy so this is something that I'm looking at in my research quite a lot and self-efficacy is basically the belief within yourself to be able to do something and like you said I was noticing and I see this with a lot of mothers in my clinic as well is there tends to be two camps so you've got the mums that just put everything into their kids and their family and put themselves last and then you know I had a mum yesterday who sat in my office and she was like I've decided that I finally have to do something for me and if honestly I had a dollar for every time I heard I finally have to do something for me like they're just so low on their priority list. The family pets come before them. Yep, it's, absolutely. It's, I'm telling you the amount of mums that I've had come to me and be like, they reel off the kind of list of things that they've had to do in that morning yes. and the family pet comes before their own needs. It's, it's, yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, also too, there is this, I don't know, this story that's out in society, in order to be a good mum, you need to sacrifice everything for your family and your children. But I don't actually subscribe to that belief. I think it's actually important for mothers to also make some time to look after their needs as well. And I I know that's hard. I like I put my hand, I know that's hard. I get that. For me as well, it's very difficult sometimes to be able to do that. But what I'm finding in my research is that people who have higher self-efficacy in their ability to be a caregiver, so their capacity and their belief in knowing that they're doing a good job, they actually don't experience as much of a decline as people who have lower self-efficacy. And I think this could probably be applied to mothers, whether mothers want to admit it or not. I think sometimes we put the needs of everyone else first because somewhere deep in our 
maybe it's conscious, maybe it's subconscious, we worry about not being a good enough mum or not being the best mum. So therefore we just keep doing and doing and doing and doing. Whereas if we can try and work on being in that space of, I am a good mum, I've got this, totally fine. Doesn't make me a bad mum if I go and exercise for half an hour or doesn't make me a bad mum if I do X, Y or Z in order to make me feel better then it just creates a more, I guess, well-rounded dynamic where the mother's needs get met, the children's needs get met, and everyone's happy. Absolutely. And it's funny that you say that because recently on a podcast, I was speaking with someone about mum rage. Yes. And unmet needs was one of the yeah. key, key things that causes mum rage. Yes. So it's amazing isn't it there's yeah. these unmet needs that can you know see a decline in health for the for the mother unmet needs seeing mum rage come up so I definitely think that caring for themselves and I love that self-efficacy mm. as well it's, I didn't that, come up with that full disclosure that's not my theory it's been around since the 1980s like it's it's a very well-known psychological theory that can be applied to a variety of different aspects. And I think if we can look at improving our overall self-efficacy in whatever area it is, whether that's caregiving, whether that's eating well, whether that's knowing how to exercise, it's a belief in any skill. So yeah, we generally have better outcomes with higher levels of self-efficacy. I love that. I feel like there's, I feel like there's, there's something in that. I'm, yeah. I'm going to explore that more. <laughs> now, before we wrap up, I would like to ask you one last question, if that's okay. Yes. And that is, what's the one thing that you wish all women knew before they had a baby? Yeah, I had a feeling you were going to ask me this question, having listened to previous podcasts. So I thought, oh, what? And I really sat with this and thought about it because I think it's a really powerful question. And what I landed on was that preparation is key. I think there are so many things that you can do to prepare your body because for a woman, pregnancy is one of the biggest physiological, hormonal, emotional, spiritual changes that you can go through. And if you were to do anything else within, you know, the realms of that, like go on an overseas trip or run a marathon or build a house or get <laughs> married or whatever it is, like there is no way we would do any of those other things without doing the groundwork and the prep work. And somehow we think that having a baby is just something that happens. And look, to be fair, once upon a time, back in the day, it probably was something that just happened. And it was something that probably just happened very naturally and very easily. But the reality is we don't live back in the day anymore. You know, we're exposed to chemicals and technology and stress and people and built environments and a whole myriad of things that make a normal, normal, can I say that normal evolutionary process that would have just happened sometimes more challenging than what it needs to be. And I think the thing with conception and pregnancy is a lot of the time the odds are against us. Like miscarriage rates are significantly high, vaginal birth rates, you know, live birth rates, all of those sorts of things. There's a lot of risk. So I think also drawing on my experience, I did everything I possibly could to put me in the best state and the best shape that I could be in order to have a healthy baby and hand on my heart. Like I just, I honestly believe that me doing all of those things and having the most amazing midwife who I trusted with my life, that that is the reason why my daughter is alive because it could have went really bad really quickly, but 
it didn't and I I don't think that was just luck like I think it was because there was a number of things in place that put us in the best possible position to get her into the world health league well, you know, they do say that luck is for those who prepare well and do all the work ahead of time, right? <laughs> yes, you make your own luck, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know, yeah, like, of course, there's always that kind of small aspect of luck and guidance and all that type of thing, but that's only 5%. Yeah. The rest of it is all of the hard work that gets done in in the back end of that, that people don't see. And then that when people have positive outcomes, they're like, oh, they're just lucky. So yeah. actually, well, no, actually, they're not just lucky. Like, sure, there is a little bit of that kind of, I can't think of the word off the top of my head. It's going to drive me crazy now. <laughs> but there is that little, there is that little aspect of being blessed in some way, but then you can't discredit all the hard work that goes on behind the scenes. No. Thank you so much for your time today. And thank you so much for sharing your story. And I can see that there is still so much emotion there. So thank you for going to those places and sharing so openly about your journey and giving so many helpful tips. It's been so, so insightful. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. And if you're hearing this message, I want to say a huge thank you because it means that you've listened to this entire episode. Of course, if you have any questions about the things that we covered in this episode or want to know more about me or my other projects, you can find me on YouTube and Instagram at The Pregnancy Process. For those currently in their conception or pregnancy journey, you can actually apply to join my complimentary but private community, The Preggy Training Crew. And you'll find my community application and social media links in the episode description. And of course, if you enjoyed this episode, I absolutely encourage you to share it with other women just like you. And I look forward to seeing you in the next episode.